for spiritual inventory. What does spiritual inventory require? Taking the time to do it. Amen. Okay? Amen. There's not going to be any spiritual inventory in your life if you don't deliberately take the time to do it. Amen. Okay? So, let's look at Psalm 63, and I want to read these eight verses for you as we begin today. O oh God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary, because thy loving kindness is better than life, my oh. lips shall praise thee. Bless thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches, because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. My soul followeth hard after thee. Thy right hand upholdeth me. That's as far as we're going to get today in Psalm 63. You know, Christians are good at cliches. And we all have them. If we've been Christians very long, we have our pet cliches. Sometimes we use our cliches to show how spiritual we really are, or at least to make people think how spiritual we are. Here's one of the favorites. I keep short accounts with God. You ever heard that cliche? Mm -hmm. I keep short accounts with God. I wonder, you know, after being in the ministry for over 45 years, I wonder how many Christians really keep short accounts with God. Amen. I really wonder. So, we could begin our spiritual inventory in one of a thousand different passages of Scripture, but I want to use Psalm 63 as our starting point for the purposes of our lesson today. And my primary focus uh, in this uh, spiritual inventory that we're going to take together today is not to verse by verse explain the, the text, what the text says. I'll point out a couple of things that I think you'll find interesting. But my primary focus is to prompt a series of questions to stimulate the importance of spiritual inventory. I'm going to ask some questions as we go through the first eight verses of this song today. And they're going to be pointed questions. And they're, they're questions that are designed to get us to think about our relationship to Psalm 63. So, what's the background of this psalm? You'll notice uh, in verse 1, or just before verse 1, it says, A psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. This is the story of David's escape from his own son Absalom. You remember that mm. Absalom wanted to take over the throne of David. Yes. He betrayed his own father. And David, as a consequence, was driven into the desert. He was in a very difficult and desperate situation. And when I say he was in a difficult situation, I mean he was in a difficult situation emotionally, 
spiritually, physically, and mentally. Amen. He was going through it, folks. Just like some of you and I have gone through hard times. And when we go through difficult times, it affects us emotionally and spiritually and physically and mentally. So uh, I, the, the psalm is, is divided, the first eight verses, um, in, in the first three verses, which we just read, uh, David expresses his longing, his deep desire for God. And then verses four through eight, he expresses his desire, good morning, Valerie, he expresses his desire to live for God based upon his relationship with the Lord. And those two points, his longing for God and his desire to live for God, uh, kind of give us the focus for our spiritual inventory. So let's go through these first eight verses and we're going to just take them slow and see how far the Lord will let us get today. So I have all the verses on the PowerPoint. Uh, so verse one, O oh God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. That's where David was, right? He was Amen. in the desert. Yeah. He was running from his son Absalom. So, I want to ask you some questions today to prompt some spiritual inventory in your own life, okay? And you're not too old or too young to do this spiritual inventory. Amen. Okay? Doesn't matter how old you are, you need to do some spiritual inventory. So, just based on verse 1 now, I want to ask you four questions. Here's the first one. Can I boldly declare, O oh God... You are my God. David could boldly declare that reality in his own life. Okay? Now, I want you to notice that the word God appears twice, not only in the question, but in the verse. Amen. And uh, in, the, in our translation here, you'll notice there's a difference between the two words for God. Amen. Peter, what's the difference? Uh, one is plural, and the other one has to do with the sovereignty of God. Okay, wow. That's exactly correct. You'll notice that the first God is all capitals. And the second God is just a capital G and lowercase O-D. Okay? So, do you have that in your, in your version? Oh, yes. Mine is all uh, capital letters. Mine's all capital, but yeah. Marjorie's isn't. My, the first one is just not capital. Wow. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. There's a difference. Okay. All right. Wow. Well, I have an inspired version of the King James, and she doesn't. Obviously. That's right. Amen. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, why did they capitalize one and not capitalize the other? And the reason is is because they're a different form of the word. Okay? Amen. They are a different form. And Peter is exactly right. Okay? The first word, which is all capitals, is plural. And it's a veiled reference to the Godhead, to the Amen. Trinity. Yes. Okay? The second word, God, is in the singular. And its emphasis is on the power of God. Amen. The strength of God. And I will tell you, I can, I can only assume that what David was declaring in this verse was, I'm in good hands. Amen. You know, there's an ad on the TV, right? I'm, you're in good hands with Allstate. Mm -hmm. Well, let me tell you, you're in much better hands Amen. With, the, with the Godhead Amen. as your power. So is God your God? 
Amen. Do you know him personally? Is he your Lord and Savior? That's where David begins. He can Amen. boldly declare, God is my God. All right, here's the second question. Is seeking God early my top, top priority for the day? Now, I can't answer that question for you. But you can answer it for yourself. Is it a top priority for you to seek God every day? Now, here's something that I think you'll find very interesting. The Hebrew word that's translated early here is not necessarily related to the time of day that you get out of bed. Okay? Now let me tell you why I say that. This Hebrew word is used 12 times in the Old Testament. And frequently when this word is used, it's describing a person who seeks God passionately. Doesn't depend upon the time of day. Amen. Passionately, painstakingly, diligently, yes. earnestly, regardless of what time it is. Yes. So, is seeking God something that you do with passion? I ran into a sermon illustration the other day. Uh, Annette and I live on a golf course in Linden. And due to some mismanagement by the previous manager of the golf course, the owner of the golf course, who lives in Vancouver and is a Chinese gentleman, uh, he shut the golf course down about six weeks ago. And then the manager took all of the equipment and sold it online so that the new owners, because the golf course has been for sale for about three years, the new owners wouldn't have any equipment to maintain the golf course. <laughs> now, there is a, a man in Linden, a businessman in Linden, who has stepped forward. In fact, he has earnest money down. He said, I'll buy the golf course. And the reason he's buying the golf course is for his son. His son's name is Willie. And Willie has a passion for golf, the game of golf. I mean, this kid loves the game of golf. So after they evicted this um, manager from the golf course, the owner gave Willie the permission, gave Willie permission to come back onto the golf course and start getting it maintained so that the golf course can eventually be sold to his dad and, and reopen. I'm telling you, Willie is out there 18 hours a day working on that golf course. He has one little a riding lawnmower and one push mower. And on Friday, I was walking down around the golf course and there was Willie mowing with, with a push mower one of the greens on the golf course. I said, Willie, you're going to be my sermon illustration on Sunday. <laughs> wow. I said, you're a man of passion. He's painstakingly caring for that golf course, even though his dad doesn't even own it yet. Okay? Do you have that kind of passion for God? That's what David is saying here. I'm going to seek God, and I'm going to make seeking of God a top priority in my life. All right? Here's a third question based on verse 1. Does my soul thirst after God? Have you ever really been thirsty? I mean really thirsty. I mean really thirsty. Like you've gone for water without water for two days. I mean you, you're, you'll, you'll be thirsty. 
sometimes if you eat salty food, you get thirsty. I find myself in, in recent years, um, you may not believe this, and my wife is experiencing the same thing. We get thirsty after eating ice cream. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's something in the ice cream. Wow. I don't know what it is. Maybe your Canadian ice cream doesn't make you thirsty, but American ice cream makes us thirsty. Okay? So, he says, does my soul thirst for God? The word soul here refers to the inner man. Amen. The soul that knows the depths of its own need for God will thirst after God. You will be like that deer by the water brook that David speaks of in the Psalm 40. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. You'll pant after the water brook. Okay? So you have to ask yourself the question, does my soul thirst for God? Here's a fourth question. Does my flesh long for God? So while the soul represents the inner man, what do you think the flesh represents? The outer man. Amen. So he's talking about the totality of his being, his person. He says, I, I'm passionately seeking God inwardly and outwardly in my life. All right, let's move on to verse 2. These are good questions to ask Amen. yourself. Okay? Verse 2. <coughs> to see thy power and thy glory as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. All right? This elicits a question. Do I see God's power and God's... Whoops. I went too far. I must have hit the button. There. Okay. Do I see God's power and God's glory in my life? Hmm. Do you? Again, I can't answer that question for you. And if you are not seeing God's power in your life daily and not seeing God's glory the character of God through your life. If you're not seeing those things, if those things are not evident in your life, I think you ought to ask yourself, how come that's not true in my life? Amen. Why is it that David could see these things, but I can't see them? And if you don't see them in your life, what are you going to do to change whatever needs to be changed in order that those things will be evident in your life? Or are you going to be satisfied not to see God's power and God's glory in your life? I hope that's not true of you. Verse 3. Because thy loving kindness is better than life, That's an amazing statement. Amen. You should not think about that. God's loving kindness was better than David's physical life. Yes. And because of that, he says, my lips shall praise thee. So, I think there's an obvious question that flows out of that statement. Is God's <laughs> loving kindness better than your life? If you had to make a choice between having God's loving kindness or being dead, what would you choose? Mm -hmm. That's an interesting thought. Because here is David. His life was literally on the line for God as he's fleeing into the wilderness. And in spite of the danger that he was facing, he was overwhelmed by God's loving kindness. And as precious as life was to David, as precious as that was, and he wasn't looking to die, he recognized that life wasn't worth living if God's loving kindness wasn't evident in his life. Amen. It's better than life 
because it secures the life to come. Amen. Yeah. Well, there's another question that's prompted here in verse 3. Do my lips praise God? Do my lips praise God? You know, sometimes we as Christians, Amen. and we're all guilty of this, we get a little sloppy in our terminology. Okay? Yes. And what, what, what I'm referring to here is that sometimes we intermingle praise and thanksgiving, and we think they're the same thing. Mm -hmm. They're actually not the same thing. Okay? So let's distinguish them very quickly. What's the difference? Praise, this is very simple. Praise has to do with who God is. Amen. Who God is. Thanksgiving refers to what God does for you. Amen. Okay? Now, we're good at the <laughs> latter. We're, we're good, uh, you know, uh, we're good at Thanksgiving. We're not too hot when it comes to praise. You ask yourself this question. How many times a day do I praise God? What I mean by that, how many times do I simply come to God and tell him what I think about him? Don't ask Amen. him for anything. Don't thank him for anything. Just simply love on God. Amen. That's what praise is. And here's David in the heat of the desert with Absalom on his heels, wanting to kill him, and David is saying his focus was on God. Amen. How good God is, how faithful God is, how great God is, how Amen. gracious God is, how holy God is, how righteous God is, how powerful God is. Amen. That was his focus. I'll tell you, if you get your focus on the problem solver, Amen. It'll put your problems into proper perspective. Hallelujah. Do my lips praise him? Verse 4. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. Amen. Hmm. Now wait a second here. Did David make a mistake here? Shouldn't David have said, therefore God will bless me? Hmm. That's not no. what he said. Amen. <laughs> have you ever thought of the fact that you can bless God? Amen. Yeah, you can bless God. Praise the Lord. This word bless, bless means to eulogize. You know what a eulogy is at a funeral? Yes. Huh? When they tell all the good things about the person who died even if he was a bum. <laughs> they always come up with something good to say. <laughs> eulogy, okay? So when you eulogize God, you're telling God all the good things about him. Amen. That you love about him. That's what it means to bless God, okay? So, because of your answer in verse 3 regarding praise... Do I bless him while I am still breathing? Do I bless him while I am still alive? You do that. You bless God. Well, here's another question. Do <laughs> you ever lift up your hands to God in blessing him? This is one of those no-no's in Baptist churches, right? Only Pentecostals do that, right? And they get, you know, they do all this. I went to a, a, a political meeting years ago, and we were singing the national anthem. <clears throat> and there were people in the audience that were raising their hands. And I thought, I found that kind of odd, okay? So, you know my son Randy. I think he's preached here before. Yes. No, you don't know Randy? No, I don't. Oh, he's a, he's he's a, a chip off man. the old block, let me tell you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, Randy, uh, 
I've noticed in recent months that when we're singing, he, he raises his hand a little bit. Okay? He doesn't do it um, to be obnoxious. It's just his way of, you know, signaling to God how much he loves him. Okay? Amen. So I don't, I don't, I don't encourage hand raising in a church context, okay? Because I think it can get out of hand. Yes. But there's nothing wrong with doing it in your own private home. Amen. Just raising your hand to the Lord while you're praising Him. Okay? <clears throat> you might try it sometime. Okay? All right. Verse 5. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness. And my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. Amen. So true satisfaction, true satisfaction is only found in God. Amen. I don't care what other satisfactions you get out of life, and there are some, but the best satisfaction comes from God. Amen. So you think about David's situation as he's writing these words. He's been forced to leave behind everything that he possessed. Yes. He's basically escaping with the clothes on his back and the sandals on his feet. And he's in the hot desert. He's on the run. He's fleeing for his life. And he feels terribly sorry for himself. Does he? No, he does not feel sorry for himself. Hmm. He is satisfied, but he's not sorry. Amen. So let's ask some questions. Is your soul satisfied with God? Is it truly? Do you find if you had nothing else except the clothes on your back, would God be sufficient? Would God be enough to satisfy you? Second question, do you audibly praise the Lord? This goes back to the previous verses. Okay? Do you Amen. verbalize your praise to God? I try to do it several times a day. Just take a brief moment and stop and pause and just simply love on God. Amen. And Amen. do it joyfully. Verse 6. When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches. Let me say something about, uh, go back to verse uh, 5 a minute. You see that word in verse 5, morrow? Yes. What's morrow? It's you say, oh, that's a shortened term of tomorrow. No. No, what's morrow? Valerie, do you know what morrow is? Is it from the uh, bone marrow? Okay, w w what's significant about bone marrow? Mm. It's the production what's of the, What's the purpose of do you have bone marrow? Yes. You better have it. Yeah. What does it do? What's the purpose of bone marrow? The production of red blood cells. It's what produces the blood in your body. Yep. It comes from this, the core of, of your bones. Amen. Okay? So without it, you're essentially dead. Amen. Because the life of the flesh is in, in the, the blood. blood. Amen. Amen. Okay? So he says, I'm going to be as satisfied with God as I am satisfied with the blood that's flowing out of my marrow. Amen. And if that blood that's flowing out of that marrow is absolutely necessary for my physical life, then praising God is necessary for my spiritual life. Amen. Okay. So, again, verse 6, when I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches. David is sleepless. He's awake. And he decided that since he's a shepherd, he wants to get back to sleep, he's going to count sheep. 
Is that what the verse says? Not at all. Is he counting sheep? No. Nay. No. Nay. He wasn't brooding about his problems. He was thinking about God. Amen. <laughs> when you're awake at night, in the middle of the night, you can't get back to sleep, what do you think about? Amen. Yeah. Prayer. Yeah, exactly. And do you meditate? Do you chew the cud? That's what the word Amen. meditate means, right? Amen. You constantly are rethinking about God, just like a cow eats the cud, the food, chews it, swallows it, and then regurgitates it and chews it some more and swallows it into a different stomach, okay? That's what David has in mind here. So, the question is, in the middle of the night when I can't sleep, what kinds of thoughts first come into my mind? And I will tell you that how you answer that question is going to reveal a lot your relationship with God. Yes. It really will. Verse 7. Because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. Amen. So, David would ask you this question, I think. Do I reflect on past helps from God? And because of that reflection, I'm filled with rejoicing because I know that what God did to me in the past and did for me in the past to show his faithfulness to me, he's going to continue to show it to me in the present and he will show it to me in the future because God is consistent. Yes. He never changes. Never changes. And lastly... Verse 8, my soul followeth hard after thee, thy right hand upholdeth me. And the question is, does my soul really, really follow hard after God? What does this mean, follows hard after God? It literally means to cling too tightly to follow closely, to stay close to. It's the same word that Moses used in Genesis chapter 2 to describe the marriage relationship. Wow. The man shall leave his wife and shall, what's the next word? Cleave. Cleave, that's the same word, as mm -hmm. follows heart cleave unto his wife and the two shall be one flesh. Amen. That word means to stick together like glue. Amen. Are you that close to God? Hallelujah. So David sought to be as close to God as he possibly could be. He wasn't interested in seeing how close he could be to the world. Amen. Here's the second question. Can I truly and honestly declare that God's right hand upholds me? Amen. You see that, that phrase, God's right hand. Here's something that I found in a commentary. God's right hand supports and preserves me from sinking under the many trials and troubles which have lain and still lie heavy upon me and upholds me in my devotions, maintaining holy desires in my heart and preventing my being weary in thy service so that I do not lose my labor in following hard after thee. Let us always remember that we should fail and be weary of following the Lord and certainly should not follow him full, fully if his right hand did not uphold us. Amen. It is he that strengthens us in the pursuit of himself, that raises and supports good affections in us and encourages and comforts us while we are laboring after what we have not yet attained. It is by his power that we are kept from falling and enabled 
to persevere in his ways. Let him therefore have the praise and the glory. Hallelujah. So are there times when I try to walk in my own strength? Oh, yes. And the answer is, yep. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And do I have times when I doubt? You need to give those things to the Lord because doubt is the opposite of trust and faith. Amen. Doubt is a sin that grieves God. So in closing, I would suggest that every person that's hearing this lesson today is going to, to have one of three responses to what uh, we've seen here in this passage of Scripture regarding some spiritual inventory. And by the way, this isn't the only time during the week that you should be doing some spiritual inventory Amen. just because you've heard me say this, okay? This is just a, a prompting for you to do some more on your own. So some of you are going to ignore what I've said. And you're going to live, keep living life and you're not going to make any changes in your life. A second reaction will be that some of you are going to take notes. And you're going to put them in your Bible. And you may or may not take the notes out sometime in the future. And try to do a little bit of inventory. Some of you are going to take these questions seriously. You're going to follow through with some intense self-examination. You're going to make a choice between one of those three options. And I think you know the one that I would prefer that you take. Amen. So here's some final thoughts. Find a time to do the spiritual inventory that you need to do. You can use the questions that I've asked here or you can make up your own questions based upon another passage of scripture that you might read. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal the truth about yourself in how you answer these questions. Be honest with God. And then, whatever the Holy Spirit reveals, if there is a need for some changes in your life, be willing to make them for God's glory. Mm -hmm. All right, our time is gone, so let's pray. Father, we, we are so blessed by this psalm. Yes. David probably had no idea the impact that his words written 3,000 years ago would have on us in 2023. Yes. I pray, Father, that you would work your work in each of our lives. Help us be willing to take the time to do that spiritual inventory that's so important for keeping short accounts with God. Thank you for these things now in Jesus' name. Yes. Amen. 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 Amen.